Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for sticking around for, uh, for the last panel. Um, uh, my name is Scott Shoulder. Uh, I'm a partner with Cowan Debates, Abrahams & Shepard, uh, boutique entertainment, media, and art law firm here in the city. Um, I head up the litigation practice. Um, so lots and lots of questions flying around about generative AI and copyright these days. So um, here I am. I've got a really awesome panel uh, today to talk about uh, some various uh, issues concerning uh, users and creators, the blurring lines of creativity and the copyright framework. So uh, two of my favorite things, art and copyright, we get to talk about today. So that's awesome. Um, so I'll, I'll do a brief introduction uh, of the panelists. I'll let them talk a little bit about uh, their uh, respective uh, practices and professions, and then we'll get on to uh, the meat and potatoes of, of the discussion. Uh, so to my immediate right, uh, Jenny Rose Halperin. Uh, I'm going to uh, read part of her ChatGPT created bio. Um, according to ChatGPT, she is um, uh, a, a versatile expert at the crossroads of information, policy, librarianship, and technology. As director of library futures at NYU Engelberg Center, Jenny fosters the convergence of law, policy, and equitable information access. And the funny one-liner, um, funny one, oh yes, funny one sentence, Jenny Rose Halpern, a tech-savvy librarian who can merge laws, books, and bytes, delivering speeches, writing articles, and saving the world in her spare time. So thank you, um, ChatGPT, for that wonderful um, summary. Uh, next in line, we've got uh, Heather Tim, uh, an interdisciplinary artist who began using generative AI in her process two years ago, uh, and her work lies at the intersection of art and science, exploring aesthetics, power structures, and bias. Um, and uh, last but not least, all the way at the end there, Kayvon Gaffari from Maker's Place. He is the general counsel uh, of uh, Maker's Place, a premier digital artist and NFT marketplace. Prior to that, he was a uh, copyright and cybersecurity attorney at two global law firms. Uh, and he serves as an advisor for a number of organizations, including Code to Inspire, a nonprofit committed to educating female students in Afghanistan. Um, so very, very cool panel here. Um, so thank you all for being here. Uh, I, if you want to go down the line and talk a little bit about um, what you do um, so that I'm not uh, making it up for you, uh, go, go right ahead. So start with you, Jenny. Thank you so much. So I primarily work on libraries and contracts, and uh, that's not really what we're going to be talking about today, although both of those things have very much come up over the course of the day. And so I just kind of want to highlight, um, maybe as a summary, some of the things that have come up today as a way to, to prompt a discussion that will close things out in a way that feels sort of um, like a like coalescing. So, so one of the things that Stacy brought up yesterday is that she fears that we are going to be entering the worst possible version of what AI could look like, in which everything is monetized and there's sort of this the scarcity model, um, or as Dave has also said, um, a, a, the second great enclosure of the commons. And so one of the things that, um, that came up that I really like is that uh, this concept that if we put something online, we lose control. And knowing that most artists are utilizing platforms, very few artists are actually you know, utilizing their own tools in order to um, control their own work or putting like a robot set text on it and saying, don't call my, my work. You know, artists are using Instagram and they're using, um, Deep, DeviantArt's still a thing, but you know, and we, we saw even you know, five to 10 years ago that there was a lot of uh, backlash from artists about large scale scraping of these uh, materials uh, back when I was at Creative Commons in 2018, there was a large scandal involving the Diversity in Faces AI data set in which large numbers of Flickr, public Flickr photos were scraped by Microsoft in order to um, create an academic database that was then used by an, an AI company. And so one of the things that people have talked a lot about is this idea of consent, is this idea, you know, oh, if, if, if people kind of knew what, or know what their materials are gonna be used for, that's enough. Um, but the other thing that we hear a lot about is remuneration. Um, Molly Crabapple and a variety of other artists wrote a letter in the, new, in the LA Times a few months ago saying, uh, we are artists, uh, please do not use our work for AI. You know, Molly Crabapple was an early artist who adopted Creative Commons and has now in some ways come back on 
um, her statements about Creative Commons and her use of, of Creative Commons do largely to a position on AI. And I, and I think it's really worth kind of considering, you know, what does it look like for us as people who care about copyright and also care about artists to say, yeah, the output of AI is fair use, but at the same time we care about artists. It's very difficult in a precarious labor market to kind of, to kind of say both things. So one of the things that I maybe want to put out as a provocation that hasn't come out as much, as much as I know that you know, Creative Commons is consistently considering and reconsidering their licenses, in particular the non-commerciality and the non-commercial licenses. So I'm wondering if there is a role for Creative Commons to play in terms of user choice when it comes to commercial licenses and a reconsideration of what it truly means to be uh, commercial or non-commercial in order to support a growing commons of both cultural heritage materials as well as artistic um, materials. And I think that's it. Great, thanks. Um, so Heather, you want to um, tell uh, tell everyone a little bit about your practice and and where AI kind of fits in sure. uh, with your you know with your process and your uh, kind of thoughts around sure. the industry. Sure. Um, well, I consider myself a conceptual artist first, so the medium has never been terribly, uh, you know, a as important as the ideas that I'm trying to convey. Um, that's changed a little bit with generative AI, actually, because for the first time, um, I have a medium that's using me, um, and that's interesting, and because it also is tending to this norm, it's a place that I can explore and interrogate those biases and those structures and those norms. Um, and, uh, you know, it's been a fascinating process and where it's taken me in my work. Okay. Um, Kayvon, you want to talk a little bit about your experience and your, your role at Maker's Place and kind of Maker's Place's uh, s s spot in, in this uh, ever-growing uh, debate about generative AI? Sure. So um, as mentioned, Maker's Place is a digital art marketplace. Um, we sell, uh, we don't personally sell, but we're a marketplace where artists can sell art minted on blockchain, uh, on the Ethereum blockchain. So it's an NFT marketplace. Um, I try to stay away from the phrase NFT because it's like sometimes clouded with negative stereotypes and judgments, and I just believe that it's art, and so I'm just going to call it art um, because I actually do believe that someone you know, like next to me creates art on chain. Um, Sasha creates art on chain, um, and one thing that's been really fascinating over the past several years um, at Maker's Place is just the use, the seeing the increased type of art from artists that use AI technology. Um, and understanding how this art comes to be, understanding the process behind the artist using AI. Because a lot of times in the public view, like AI is dominated with policymakers, big corporate governments, big corporate big corporations talking about AI to commerce. It's really limited to hear in a public way how artists are actually using it and how it's actually enabling and, and, and an often, sometimes often allowing artists to improve their craft. Um, and I think of AI as just a tool, um, just like the paintbrush um, that one can use to express themselves. Um, I also think AI is really interesting in its ability to kind of democratize the way that art is created because if someone is, for example, handicapped and can't actually pick up a paintbrush, they can still use AI technology to assist in expressing their artistic vision. Um, but as a marketplace, we are grappling with a lot of issues on AI art. Is it a derivative? Is it an improper derivative, an unauthorized derivative? Is it um, art that is just generated straight from the algorithm or is the artist adding more to it? Um, and where does that process come in and how do we conceptualize that as a marketplace but also as an ecosystem on, on where that fits in in the artistic history, uh, like, oh, the history of art in that timeline? Um, so I've been grappling with those questions and uh, it's, a, it's a fun, area to be in. I get to work with artists on a daily basis, like Heather and Sasha. I get to work with incredible people like Jessica. Um, so yeah, great. Um, so speaking of this, uh, you know, the use of AI in the process and whether it's, uh, you know, you're entering a prompt and just using the output or whether you're in painting, out painting, glitching, uh, you know, creating a, a, a collage, 
Um, I, I, I want to throw it to our, our resident artist on the panel. Um, how, in your experience, and you can, Heather, you can talk you know, about your own use of, of AI in, in creating your digital art um, and your experience in, in the art community about how other people are using it and, and how is it really changing the creative process uh, in general? Well, I think in some ways it's, it's not. You know, I think a lot of the same things are the same things over and over again. It's just different, different tools being used to explore them um, in different happy accidents mm. uh, in the process. Um, I think um, there's a lot of fear around AI and a lot of judgment around it. Um, and so I think that makes it particularly interesting um, to prove out whether those things are true, right? Like, if this is soulless, right? Is it more or less soulless than my cobalt blue paint, right? Is it what I do with it, right? Like, I think it, it begs these deeper questions. Um, I think art always does, and I think good art is always blurring lines. Um, so, yeah. Um, and, and so it's interesting, you talk about kind of the same things over and over again. Um, the, the, the nature of anything creative is to build on previous works. You can't have new art without having influence, having been influenced by prior art, whether you're writing, whether you're painting, whether you're creating digital art. Um, Jenny, I wanted, I wanted to ask you if, if creativity inherently builds on the past how, how is this kind of manifesting in the AI environment, and is is it actually any different from the creativity uh, that has always been, and, uh, and and the processes that have always existed? And uh, you know, I'll, I'll I'll let you start, and obviously throw it out to the the rest of the panel to to uh, weigh in as well. Yeah, I mean, isn't it isn't it so cool that we get to see the variety and the velocity and the and the volume of what learning really can look like? And in so many ways, I think that's that's a really, really interesting and unique spot that a place that we have right now, even if the inputs aren't always clear, even if the outputs aren't always obvious. There was the case that came up or the, the paper that came up, uh, I think this, I think today that said, well, we actually can't tell the, the difference between AI written text and human written text in many cases in an educational context. And in, in many ways, that's that's very cool that like, you know, we get to see the ways in which uh, machines that have been trained over many years on, on a large variety of human knowledge can really um, mimic, you know, it's the original Turing test, right? It's like that, you know, a uh, computer that can mimic a human. Um, but even further, I think from, from artists, one of the things that I, I am concerned about is that there's this idea that it's somehow, it is very different than the acquisition of human knowledge, um, but I don't necessarily know if it's different outside of, again, the labor conditions that we have than necessarily um, artists, certain artists um, seem to think. So, um, you know, I know that the uh, SAG AFTRA strike has come up a couple of times um, today. So one of the, there was a recent discussion on a great listserv that if you're not on, you should be on. There's some really good conversation about uh, AI on it called Read20. Um, and on that, and in that discussion, uh, somebody brought up an, an article that uh, featured David Simon, the author of The Wire. And the interviewer asked him, you know, how would you feel about an AI written script? And he said, I am a unique creative genius and I do not build on anything. <laughs> And if AI wrote my script, it would not be any good because I would, you know, it, it, nothing, nothing like anything I have ever created has ever come before. And of course, you know, um, of course I'm exaggerating. That's not exactly what he said, but I think it's, mo it's, it's, there is a level, particularly for artists, particularly for collaborative artists like David Simon, who, you know, writes as part of a writer's room, for example, and does not write in complete isolation. No one does. Um, there, there is a level of education of what these tools can do and um, also a level of, of almost letting go of some elitism of that, you know, for some commercial artists, the ability to edit an AI-generated um, piece 
rather than having to spend an enormous amount of time outside of their own work might be something that's interesting. And I do think there is within sort of some, some level of public discourse, a level of elitism, that that might not be as legitimate a form of art. And I also, last thing, do think that there is um, both an opportunity to collaborate with machines and also a, uh, that's, that's unique and that's cool and that's interesting. And I think that there is an opportunity to collaborate with each other, whether that's through the very human act of editing or if that's through the, the very human act of, of co-creation. Um, there's uh, one other uh, conversation that's been happening a lot, which is, as Marta brought up, the um, original, uh, the case around um, originality and photography of who should hold a the copyright on a photograph. And you know, why is it that someone who writes an algorithm should, have, should not have copyright ability more than somebody who just takes a click, right? There's just a there's there you know it is a changing landscape and laws and norms and values do need to catch up. Um, Heather or Kayvon want to weigh in? Well, I think this I, I agree with the notion that look there there's no original thought. It's our interaction with each other that creates the emergence of of the ideas. I. I think we're all dipping from the same well of creativity, and that well of creativity is the original AI, which is ancestral intelligence. And, um, yeah. I just, um, we're influenced by everything, consciously or not. And that has an impact on what we, our outcome, right? Whether it's legal laws, whether it's working with people as a lawyer, working with people and seeing how their brains work, they influence how my brain works in terms of thinking out of the box for legal strategy, right? And, and it, 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 I just think everything is a derivative. Now, I think the, pro the, the, the fear of AI is that it's scaling it at a, an incredible pace that I think is understandable and having this kind of pushback and it's like, whoa, 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 how are you doing that? Why are you doing it this fast? Is it straight up just like copying? But in my mind, it's just, another method of being influenced by things. Like we think about like chess, right? Humans were playing against computers for decades. That's all AI, right? If you think about Photoshop, Photoshop is AI as well. But that doesn't somehow get grouped together with these generative AI algorithms. But we've been using and experiencing AI technology throughout our entire lives. Um, and, that, and, and there's a part of me that's like, well, why is this a little bit different when all those are taking prior information, prior plays um, in chess that um, chess legends or chess masters before them like created or thought of. One thing to add, there's a um, tool that is created called the clip interrogator um, and right intended to interrogate uh, images generated by AI, uh, so that you could create similar images, right, or similar styles. Um, and I've used that to take paintings that I did back when I was a teenager and snap a photo and put it in the clip interrogator um, to interrogate those influences, right? And so it's, it's interesting to, to do that for what it's intended to and not intended. Yeah, go ahead. And I, I do want to also say, you know, like, um, just to sort of maybe add add some level of like so, uh, some level of, of nuance, building on some of the conversations, particularly about decolonization that have happened bef that have been that have come up all across today. Is you know, 20 years ago, the conversation around um, decolonization and digital collections was very very different when Creative Commons was founded. And in certain ways, the open movement, which was about sharing for everybody and remix and everything's so cool and isn't it awesome that all art is free online, had to catch up. And we really did have to play catch up um, for those of us who have been involved for a long time. And I, and I really do see this as being an opportunity in which we don't have to necessarily play catch up. We can interrogate and engage with these questions early and not have to layer on, you know, if an indigenous artist is not okay with their work being included in a, in a data set, the power differential is very major. If an artist who doesn't necessarily have the same economic power as uh, Shepard Ferry 
is concerned about their work being included in a data set, there is a power differential. And I think that that level of both market power and also um, cultural power does have to be interrogated when we consider new, when we consider any new technology, but also particularly when we're considering cultural use of AI technologies that have also been, you know, by organizations like the Algorithmic Justice League, um, engaged with at a fundamental level as well for many years. Is anyone taking a toll as to how many times the word interrogate has been said today? I just said I it, it five I know. times. There's, there's, two lawyers, there's two lawyers on this panel. It's totally okay to use okay. that word. Um, so, Kayvon, your point earlier about, you know, why is this different from other uh, advances in technology like, like Photoshop, I, I think that it has to do with uh, the scale uh, and, and the ease of use. And uh, Photoshop is, you know, not dissimilar in the sense that it, it uses computer uh, you know, software to, to augment uh, images in a way that you wouldn't necessarily be able to do by hand. But you still have to learn how to use Photoshop. I think the ease with which that one can just type the prompt in and come up with something, even if they don't do any editing, uh, they don't touch it at all, you still get something that passes for probably something better than I could draw. Um, definitely something better than I could draw. Uh, so I think it's I think it's those two things put together that makes it so makes it different from the other the other things but then that kind of begs the question about um, if you're just putting the prompt in uh, and coming up with an image uh, what are the copyright implications uh, of you know and where where are we drawing the line between who's an author and who is just a user of the, of the platform um, do, so you know from a copyright standpoint and in a legal standpoint I'll, I'll, I'll throw the question to you um, I will uh, I probably should have given my standard disclaimer uh, at the begin <laughs> beginning of the, the panel that, any, that anything that, that I say here with respect to the legal you know, aspects or moral or ethical aspects of, of this stuff is, not, is my opinion and not that of my firm or my client. Um, so I'll, 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 I'll have you start off the discussion on the copyright piece of it uh, and then I will tread carefully into those waters if I need to. I guess I have to follow suit and give a disclaimer as well because I'm a lawyer. Um, don't interrogate me. Um, I, I, I think the copyright questions are, are, are fascinating, um, and I, I don't think I, the, the, photo, the photograph case, um, National Geographic, it was a case about like an ape in um, Africa, I think, yeah. and a, a, a pita suit, yeah. and he took Naruto. a puppy. It was um, Naruto was his name. He's, he's my favorite. It's a, yeah. it's a my favorite, my, my favorite copyright celebrity is Naruto. I, yeah. So at a preliminary level, I think a lot of issues of like creativity and ownership are gonna be dictated by the terms of use. Um, I would definitely look at those terms of whatever AI system you are using to see who is the actual creator of the output because those terms may actually say that the, algorithm, that the company that is providing you that technology is the actual creator. Um, so as a threshold level, I would encourage everyone to, uh, to look at the terms. Um, whether they're crafted eloquently or negatively is uh, for the lawyers to uh, decide. But I think beyond that, assuming that's not the case, then I think it becomes in many ways an issue of the, the amount of input or influence you as an artist are providing um, into the actual output. Um, for example, if I write the word nurse in mid-journey and I get four images of a nurse, I don't know how much like there's human involvement in that. Now the counter argument is, well, that algorithm wouldn't have put out that output if it wasn't for me introducing a concept or a word to then click generate. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's gonna be a lot of discussions in, in courts about, well, is that just clicking submit enough of a human interaction to have that? Um, I, I'm not confident that will be the case. Um, I think what the courts will likely and I think this will take years to, if not more, to, to think about is um, the level of input at the post output like manipulation. And there's kind of a case going on right now in the copyright office with uh, Chris, I can never pronounce their last name. Chris Castronova. Castronova. Um, they created a comic book from AI. Um, and it's a pretty incredible book, uh, both uh, the images, the, the writing, I believe as well, the only thing that they did, well, they created the inputs. Um, the US Copyright Office claimed it wasn't copyrightable. 
because it was created by an algorithm and not a human. Uh, they are pushing back, um, claiming that there is creativity in this. Um, I believe the most recent procedural posture is that the Copyright Office rescinded its denial in the higher in the like organization of the comic book because Chris uh, organized it in a in a dip, in a way that only they did. Right. So the structure, sequence, and organization of it was created by them, and. The Copyright Office found that that was a human um, creating that structure, sequence, and organization, SSO. Um, but I think they are continuing to claim that the comic book is in fact still human generated, even though it had a technological medium by which the output was generated. Yeah, the, the, the copyright, and, the, and this spawned the recent guidance from the Copyright Office that came out in Rye, I think in March, uh, about authorship of AI generated works and how to properly register an, uh, a work that has AI content. Um, yes, the, to the whole comic book itself as a, as a um, compilation was copyrightable. The text was copyrightable, the images were not. And that brought the Copyright Office to give guidance on what you need to do when you register works. You have to disclaim that there are uh, AI. It's, you had to disclaim things anyway, disclaim things that are in public domain, disclaim things that were previously registered. You have to disclaim so you have to, there's no, I'm sure people are, are going to not do it, um, but uh, technically you're supposed to write, you know, this work has some AI generated images or something like that. And then your, your protection is limited to only what, uh, what, what is human, uh, human created. But again, begs the question of what is the level of creativity that needs to be uh, uh, added by a person to make those images copyrightable. Until a court says otherwise, the Copyright Office is not going to honor um, non-human authorship. Um, and it's, it has to be more than de minimis in that it in and of itself has to be independently copyrightable, I think, uh, at least according to the webinar on their webinar on registration. I take, the, I take them at their word. Um, any any uh, input from, from our uh, other panelists on the copyright issues? Uh, no? No, other, other than just a comment that this, you know, the law is such that it just makes me want to go CC zero with everything, <laughs> right? Um, and there are artists, there's an increasing number of artists that are doing that, and I aspire to do that. Uh, partially to explore what, there will be unintended, there's a law of unintended consequences, right? I think control, commodification, have had their time. And I'm really interested in what radical openness and radical sharing, what sort of unintended consequences come from that? Do I really lo make less money as an artist? Is that possible? <laughs> I can tell you what, I don't think it is. <laughs> um, well, so, I mean, I mean, that's always the joke, that if you want to strengthen copyright to make more money, it's not like it's doing such a good job right now. Like, it, you know, it's, it's basically like Disney every time just wins. Yes. So, um, but I also, again, you know, I hate to, to just keep beating the same drum, but when, when we're talking about copyright issues when it comes to AI, really it's, I feel like every, like a lot of the conversations that I have around this kind of end in almost like a shrug emoji of like, it's labor. Um, <laughs> but um, because, you know, a again, in absence of the precarity of being an artist, I I in taking an abundance mindset, and, I and one of the things I'm actually interested in hearing about from our other panelists is, you know, the intersections between, you know, the chain, which almost creates a kind of scarcity and AI, which is, all, which is based on an abundance model, based on the number of inputs it needs to have and sort of the differential in responses from artists or similarities in responses from artists and kind of how, how you all are working on these, on these two sort of cutting edge, in certain ways cutting edge technologies and certain ways older technologies in themselves um, together. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of wondering like how, how does that work for artists? Does it, is it a different kind of, did you see a different kind of response during the, the couple years ago where everything was about the chain and everything was about NFTs and now everything's about inputs and AI? Kind of what are the responses that you're seeing from artists? 
in terms of like the interplay between AIR minted on like a blockchain? Or are you are you seeing just in terms of um, like are, are are do you see a do you see resistance or do you see or because of the communities that you're working in do you see that it does it does it feel like it's being embraced as a new form of creation and AI. sharing? Yes. Yeah. So um, before I answer that, I'm also gonna um, touch point on the CC zero love CC zero, but you can also go to England and create art with AI technology because that will be copyrighted. <laughs> Um, the UK copyright laws does claim that you know creations from a technology can be copyrighted. Um, so hack, go travel, create, come back. You have international laws to help you. Um, back to the question of like the, the the blockchain digital art ecosystem. AI art is absolutely embraced um, in a pretty like. In, there are two things that are actually are quite embraced in my mind that I'm going to be interested in Heather's perspective as well, and Scott, because Scott is also an artist. Um, AI is absolutely embraced. Everyone pretty much uses it. Um, I don't know, like differing levels, right? Um, and what I'm seeing is not just like they're minting, minting is um, placing it on the chain, um, minting like the output, but they're using those outputs to further augment and enhance their artistic creation. So like kind of like what Sasha was saying earlier, she puts her poems in and it continues training. These artists are, are, are using, are taking a ton of time to create one AI based artwork because they're using mid journey and they're constantly prompting, revising their prompts, changing filters, using different technologies to then enhance it some more. And you're seeing this, in my mind, quite beautiful process of creating of art through a new medium, right? And I think what we're also seeing is trends in like actually showcasing the process. I think there is starting to see some like, well, is AI art too much? Is it too easy? Is it art? Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of artists are now showcasing their process, um, which is fascinating. And I think a pretty revolutionary thing as well, where you're seeing videos of like them actually using Midjourney and you're seeing the prompts and you're seeing their text and, and, and it's a pretty fascinating insight into the artistic minds. Um, and the other thing that I really love about the Web3 space is the derivatives. Mm -hmm. Like people are creating derivatives of each other like every day and no one's really batting an eye. It's a pretty remarkable thing that there's trust that I'm gonna create a derivative and not necessarily commercially exploit it, but I'm just using it as a method of you know, memes, because you know, the Web3 has a lot of meme culture, but also like understanding my own process and what I want to do as an artist. Um, and so the, like, there is an ethos of CC0 that's kind of embedded in the Web3 ecosystem um, because of that kind of derivative playing with each other kind of uh, community. Yeah, I, I think what I see is artists as collector as well. So both acknowledging people who inspire you, artists that have inspired your own work, um, that have supported your, your thinking, your growth, um, and your challenges. Um, when you have success, you're often now, how, how you're paying that forward is literally being a patron of their art, right? And so it's creating these virtuous cycles um, of value, right? If, if culture is more important than capital, then put your capital in your culture. Mm -hmm. Stick your capital up your culture. <laughs> 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 Nothing like the perspective of a conceptual artist. I love it, <laughs> love it. Um, so Let's use AI to create an output for that. Yeah, right. Um, I, so, and, 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 and Heather and I may have you know slightly different perspectives. I, am very amateur in terms of being an artist, but I, you know, stuff on Maker's Place and some various other platforms, and I do this in my spare time when I have spare time, which isn't much, um, and, and find it to be very a, a lot of fun. I don't use AI um, I f for a number of reasons. I think most of it is a test for myself to see if I can do things without it, because it's almost, um, uh, it's almost being contrarian on purpose, because when I first got it, you know, started dabbling in, in the space, the market was just flooded. Everything was, was, was AI generated. And I, as part of me started thinking, well, there's no competing with this because it's so much, like I mentioned before, it's so much better than anything I can do. Um, so what, 
you know, do you, if you can't beat them, join them. I don't know. I decided I wanted to try to beat them by doing something else. So my process is different. I don't use uh, AI, at least not yet. Um, and and so I try to push myself using other technologies. And it's not all that different, you know, using things like Procreate and Glitch Studio and, and stuff that is computerized, but not as uh, it, it doesn't involve prompting and the creation of an image by something else. So I do it almost as a resistance to the, the flood in the market. And I really liked your, um, uh, you know, your uh, kind of drawing the dichotomy between the scarcity of NFT, the NFT art, I mean, crypto art marketplace, and the massive volume of AI generated work because it's, you know, at least perceived as easier, right? And it may not be because to, you know, Kayvon's point, there's a lot of editing and iteration and ideation and, 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 and other types of work that goes into it. And I'm curious to see some of those creation videos so I can have a, a better understanding of what that process looks like because there are a lot of misconceptions and I probably still have them. Um, so it's, uh, you know, the, the use of the tools is, is uh, it should and can be used as a tool. And, uh, you know, where we get into the questions of labor is, is it, a, is it a market replacement? Is it going to replace people's work? Are people's works being used to train it to then replace them? Mm -hmm. um, and we don't, we don't have time, we, we'll take questions in a few minutes, we don't have time to get into the, in, I, don't, and I don't think we need to get into the questions of fair use and the legal arguments over scraping and output, but it's, it, it really is a labor question. And so just from an ethical or moral standpoint, I'm, I'm curious to know the, the, you know everybody's thoughts very briefly on you know how do we kind of counter the problems that may may or may not arise and are I think arising in certain industries where concept artists are being not getting as much work or uh, you know uh, there's they feel as though they're being replaced which which may or, which may be true uh, I don't think it's too early to to really tell how big an impact on the economy that it's going to have but I, I, I love everybody's input on, on the kind of labor issue and the, the they're gonna take our jobs kind of um, uh, fear that's out there. Whoever wants to start. Well, it, it kind of ties that statement with the previous thing is I will say, you know, although there's a lot of welcomeness to using generative AI, there it, it's not all sunshine, lollipops and rainbows. Um, I personally know a number of artists who have had death threats because they've used it. Um, and they're constantly verbally assaulted because they use it. Um, doxed online if they're anonymous uh, artists. Um, you know, so um, there is that, that's real. Um, Universal basic income. There you go. <laughs> free word, free word response. Like, <laughs> ditto. Oh, okay. All right. Well, uh, that certainly is a, is a solution, um, whether it's realistic or not. Uh, it's certainly laudable. Um, it's actually, uh, so Delia Brown, who's, uh, I think that's still on the CC board, said that this was being discussed in basically every other country except for the US. Yeah. That it's, a, it's like a very, it's very unique to the U.S. And that not, we've not, and, and not, I'll, I'll clarify my prior content. Not unrealistic because it's something that uh, that shouldn't be or that yeah. can't be done. It's something that the people in charge won't do yeah. or won't <laughs> allow it to be done. Um, okay, so uh, we've got we've got about five minutes left. So um, unless there are any uh, final comments on these uh, massive topics, uh, I'll open it up to, to questions and see if we okay. We've got some questions already. Love it. Even at the end of the day, at five o'clock, can come it. all day, every day. Um, and I mean, we, I just want to flag that we are at a place right now where we have, you know, I mean, in terms of the political will, of, of course, for that um, has always been difficult. But since the pandemic, we literally have so much research cases, you know, of the use cases of what it can actually look like from around the world. Um, be great to use. It would be great if we had a tool that like recognized like patterns and like <laughs> you know could take a look at some of that and maybe be like how could some how could some of that how how could we persuade a particularly capitalist government? I'm from Canada. Um, <laughs> into you know 
into considering all of this new new practice that we have of universal basic income and, and, and a tool that could extract value as well and, and spread it around. Not a question. <laughs> <laughs> Questions Sorry, or yeah. comments are welcome. Would you like yeah. to respond to the non-question? <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. So my question is, in cases where the human author only put in a prompt, but actually spend a lot of time selecting the right image, then do you think the efforts in selecting the image should come towards the creative process? And if yes, whether it's possible in future for the artist to present evidence of their effort in selection to the court and get copyright protection as a result? Um, do you mean like a selection of like a single image that then becomes like the art? I still don't think that a court in the US would claim that is copyrighted because you, by selecting something, you're not necessarily creating it. Um, and it's already been created. Um, and now, yeah. if you select it and put it in a, a, a sequence of other artworks, then that structure of other artworks and the decision to put it in a particular place, that structure can be copyrighted. Um, but not the individual disparate parts that are that are forming that structure. Yeah, at I least on, under the current framework, that I don't think that would be enough to be copyrightable, at least based on what the Copyright Office says. And, then the, and to, I, I noticed what you, you mentioned specifically about spending a lot of kind of time and effort choosing the right image, and that there was something called the sweat of the brow doctrine uh, mm -hmm. that was done away with many, many decades ago by, by the courts and copyright cases that said, so it doesn't really matter how hard you work. If it's not copyrightable, it's not copy. Like, you know, if you work really hard in gathering data, just public facts, to Kayvon's point, the, the selection arrangement and coordination of those facts could potentially be copyrightable. But the facts themselves are not, no matter how hard it how, how hard you work to, I, to find them. I'd uh, like to I'd like to just, you know, copyright law aside for a second and and back to art. Um, In the traditional art world, okay, it's pretty common knowledge that um, many of the most um, wealthy and popular artists do not create their own work. Okay, they hold a vision, they give a color palette, and it's a bunch of art students and grad students who are actually doing the labor. Okay, tell me how it's different than a prompt. And then we can have a real discussion. <laughs> now, interestingly, I think the prompt is copyrightable. So think about that, right? Like, because a prompt is an expression, and copyright is providing a limited monopoly on expression, not on ideas. And so your prompt actually could be copyrighted. Maybe the output isn't, though. In short, yeah, if it's a, if it's a sentence, a, a, a poem, paragraph a short phrase you know my favorite example I don't ask me why I don't know I came up with this during one of my early presentations on, on AI if you type in squirrel riding a bicycle into mid journey you will get some pretty uh, hilarious and adorable images um, but squirrel riding a bicycle as a prompt is not right. is not enough to be right. copyrightable if you write a little story about that squirrel riding a bicycle and what happens along the way that's potentially copyrightable and then you could argue that whatever comes out of it is a derivative a derivative work that requires a license. So there's a lot of potential loopholes that haven't been um, uh, uh, litigated or legislated on uh, that who knows where it'll go. Um, maybe time for one more, if, if there's one more question. Uh, Hi, uh, my name is Prakash Rajagopal and I bring about 30 years working with state and local governments in the US. Uh, so I have a question, good point about the universal basic uh, income. So, so far, the story has been a, at least the resistance part of the universal basic income, or whether it is basic income in the US, the minimum wage. Um, it has been that, you know, quote unquote, we want to incentivize work. Um, and that's why there's some resistance towards a minimum wage or a universal basic income. So now we are faced with, whether we are faced with it today or in the short term or definitely in the long term, is the question of you know either provide work or you provide basic income, universal basic income, or both 
in some way, shape, or form. So what are your thoughts on that? I'll leave it to you, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, ch uh, changing times need changing norms. Um, and, and I'm sorry, I can't remember your name. Uh, Karen pointed out that this has been implemented with good and bad consequences in many different places. Um, so, so that being said, I mean, I, I, like we didn't really talk about anything other than creativity, but there are approximately eight million jobs in the U.S. at least that are administrative, um, jobs like ultrasound technician, jobs like uh, administrative assistant. Many lawyers are probably going to find themselves, uh, you know, not not as needed, and and so you know. Um, well, you know, there. I, I do think that there is a changing uh, th that the, that the world is changing around us, and and in some ways we've already seen it happen. I mean, the the question I always ask people when I when I talk about AI is like, when's the last time you used a travel agent? Really good flight algorithms to choose your flight has made it, and also the changing norms around work that now I'm expected to spend several hours of my work week choosing my flights. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, these two things have changed around us and nothing has, particularly besides the algorithm, sprung up to replace it. But those are jobs that have been lost and hopefully those people can be reskilled or they can't and then there needs to be a changing um, rule. But, you know, when it comes to the question of creative commons and how, you know, we really can foster a global commons, if I can just sort of leave us with this, David Bollier, a scholar of the commons, says that there are three main things that need to happen within a, a, a global commons, and that it, or within a common system, and that is governance, social life, and provisioning. So if we consider something like universal basic income, or at least a minimum standard of living as a provisioning, norms and governance as, uh, go norms as a governance, and then we have creative commons. It's a social life, right? We're, we are a community of people who are coming together around these questions. And so I, I really want, when we think about creative commons, to, to really think about how creative commons can really be a commons and foster policies and, um, again, I'm using the same word, norms, that, that do foster these three elements of commons. 